Hey guys, welcome back. This is Jester Boris with I Wanna Be a GM. <laughs> this is D D Through the Ages Part Three: The Fighter. And with me on my right, Troy the Planescape Guy. To my left, Gwitty and the Long Winded. And these are the supplement years. <laughs> that is right. We are doing Advanced Dungeons and Dragons Second Edition. A very good core system with a ton of supplements. So uh, to the basics, we're sticking with the. Uh, D10 on the fighter still has all access for armor weapons, uh, magical weapons, and some utility magic items. So that hasn't really changed since first edition. Um, but we did see some expansion in uh, that some of the proficiencies that specializations that were put into the first edition's unarmed arcana make their way into the system formally, and um. We, we just had have, a lot. Yeah, we yeah. have groups <laughs> well, there's, of character classes instead of just, you know, a character it, class. There was there was some interesting uh, like nomenclature differences. Yeah, that didn't necessarily affect mechanically the game, but one of the things we did end up with through the expansions were just some really crazy player options for your character. Um, Gwydion, and you've got some highlights for us. Tell us a little bit about <laughs> what fighters could do. How did they start getting crazy? Uh, it was, it was kind of goofy, everything that went on. Um, there were so many new ways to break the game in AD&D 2. It was glorious. Uh, <laughs> it, was, it was. The Book of Elves came up with two really nice ones. Uh, the Blade Slinger subclass could wield a one-handed weapon and throw spells in the other. Uh, this is basically the father of the Pathfinder Magus, which yeah. is my personal favorite character. Of and we see that brought now into 5th edition as well. Yeah. Uh, the Elven Archer, uh, they could start out by uh, tossing three arrows uh, in a round. And like you said in earlier editions, you get the right specialization, the right feats, the right uh, aspects and equipment, and you were Legolas. You know, tossing mm -hmm. these things by everybody mm -hmm. uh, faster than they could see you pulling mm -hmm. them out of your quiver. Uh, one of the near comical classes was the dark knight now i'm not talking the dark knight not no, batman. what that mean I'm, ta <laughs> I'm talking dark knight um yeah at the bar with your darts and your beer he specialized <laughs> in darts a low level character could throw six darts per round each doing their original one die six of damage it hadn't got down to where they turned it to one die three Later right. in the game, it was one die six plus strength bonus for damage. Uh, yeah, check them. <laughs> so if you gave him a full 18 double out strength plus three to hit plus six damage, uh, you would have like six die six plus 36 uh, with your specialization. Uh, if you were if you hit a target with all your darts. That's uh, fireball territory. Yeah. I mean, uh, it is. And more if they were magical. Yeah. Uh, well, so... the other draw to darts in this system, because it was sort of a new player's play style, um, but poisons. Mm -hmm. uh, so a lot of poisons were introduced and things of that nature. And if you're so, under a haste spell, that made it even more Oh, yeah. Broken. Then now you can start to buff. And, yeah, it just became kind of... <laughs> yeah. Uh, hey, why are you complaining that this was broken? A little bit ago, you are bragging about your... Hundredth level fighter that could just <laughs> he clean up the nine attacks per he, round. He got taken out by a first level dart knight. That was my issue <laughs> whenever I came <laughs> in. Serves you right. Yeah, I just envisioned somebody with you know crossed bandoliers, a belt of uh, you know on a belt and a bag of holding containing like unlimited darts. So I don't know. <laughs> yeah, there was there was just. When you started specializing here, it was no longer plus one and plus two. Mm -hmm. You actually had a specialization, and you could run your character into a line on your tree that would give you the maximum damage or buff mm -hmm. or healing as your character required for the way you played. Yeah, so as we, we mentioned here, um, still have some... Level restrictions by class mm -hmm. uh, based on race. So dwarves, elves, halflings, gnomes, um, everybody that was non-human had different restrictions. But one of the other things is we start to look at some of the supplements that became available. Um, you know, you had mentioned the Book of Elves here, which I've got the complete Book of Elves. 
Um, so these books were really cool in that they expanded um, any whatever their subject happened to be. So here in Elves, we've got expansions regarding culture, weapons, attack styles, uh, different regions. Uh, we were introduced, um, so we had a High Elf, Tree Elf, um, Drow, all of those sorts of things. So the Drow have their own book. They do. They yeah. did get their own book. They're but, mentioned in there. Yeah. But as far as you know, the different variety, the, the Water Elf, I think, or Sea Elf, whatever they called Aquatic. it. Aquatic, sorry. Um, <laughs> hey, they're making a movie about them, so the, the two dollar word. What? <laughs> um, but you you start to get those sorts of options. So if you wanted to play an elf character, um, then you'd also find some neat expansions that were particular to elf as a fighter or an archer and, and half then, elf. So and then, but so then you take that back in original D anD D, you had a half a page, a, a paragraph of oh. what a, what is an elf. Here we yeah. have a 180-page book now about these, elves. Again, we're not required, and the no. core material still covers elves, but these are the expansions. And wait, also... wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Yes, every single supplement is required to be purchased <laughs> no, <laughs> It really isn't, but uh, just as a, as a note here, uh, the number on the back of the book here is $15 US. Um, and that's a heck of an expansion for 15 bucks when you can't hardly get into an adventure anymore for... Less than 50. Yeah. <laughs> but you could take the complete fighter's handbook, yep. pair it with your complete elves handbook, or and, or dwarves because we like the warhammer better. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but this would open the options you had as a player. And since they're small, they made one book for both. <laughs> yes, gnomes and half gnomes and half -lines. Well, the other thing that was interesting <laughs> is at the time. Uh, I think particularly in Forgotten Realms, they had a lot of crossover in terms of culture, they where they lived, how they were accepted by society, yep. and so they also tended to have a lot of crossover mm -hmm. in terms of skills they would learn, uh, abilities that they had access to, and how they conducted themselves in combat, or those sorts of Gnomes things. and goblins started having a crossover because of their love of tinkering. Yes. And mechanical stuff. Yeah, so, so we get some of that. You've seen the labyrinth, right? Yeah, the <laughs> stuff that the goblins were riding and yeah. so on. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but the Tinker Gnome was what, probably my favorite race. Yeah, but as you can see, you know, you take your your um, preferred race expansion paired with your preferred class expansion, and for thirty bucks plus your core book, you had a lot of different content that you had available to improve your ex or your options. Um, when you went to put your fighter together or any of your other classes when it so came it to second edition. It took you a weekend one. to level up. It's like, which way do I want to go? Yeah. But, the Ranger, and uh, specific to the Dark Sun world setting, mm -hmm. the Gladiator, yeah. and so, just because everybody needs, you have all these different fighters, and we're getting really deep into some of their uh, lore and about their descriptions and different things. Then you have to get this one, which is for arms and equipment. <laughs> so anything and everything you always wanted to know about knives, shields, swords, axes. Or pole arms. Yeah. yeah, I mean, like the 30 different kinds. I mean, we're talking about different spearhead styles. Um, now, you wouldn't necessarily end up like these all still do a D8. So you're not dealing with crazy mechanical differences that you have to manage as a good dungeon master. But you could theme and flavor your character, uh, right. change, you know, if you, as putting a world setting together, you needed to set some regional differences. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so, and, and particularly as an investigation, like you go and you fight these guys. Well, their spearhead is shaped thusly. Mm -hmm. You're like, well, these use I... These halberds. These use pole arms. Right, and so I know that I was attacked by brigands that used weapons at least from this region. So and, different, different uh, uh, peoples that were uh, raised on horse all their life such as the Mongols and the Comanche Indian, both shot short bows from that horse in combat and for hunting, right. but their arrows and their bows look completely different. Yeah, they're 100% different. So this allowed you as a DM a quick reference for wanting to show those type of cultural differences mm -hmm. in the weapon yeah. design. And so when you were building your campaign or structuring a dungeon and you wanted to add a lot of flair to the different weapons that they're mm -hmm. finding or or being used against them in combat. Uh, one of my favorite ones to use against them, especially when you come across slavers, is one that's called a man catcher. Oh, yeah. The, it's the a big... long pole with this nasty C-shaped hook, and whack, I got you on the neck. Mm -hmm. And you can't do nothing against me because I'm out of range now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> and it's a true weapon from history. It's a true weapon. Um, which, was the other, which was the other thing that was fun. Um, if you wanted a more historical basis, 
for the things that were coming into your game, uh, you'd find that through these supplements as well. So, um, you know, like I mentioned, the core books had much of what we saw in AD&D First Edition. Um, we did get some expansions, however. Uh, we mentioned Unearthed Arcana had brought in specialization. So uh, this is a chart of the non-weapon proficiencies you can have access to, <laughs> such as leatherworking, mining, um, any of those other trade skills. Ship building, which always comes in handy in the middle of a dungeon. Uh, especially <laughs> if you're a dwarf. <laughs> <laughs> or a half barbarian with a dwarf. <laughs> you know what? That actually makes sense when you try to like makeshift your raft. But, yeah. the, but there are ones that really come in handy, <laughs> such as navigation. Yeah. So if you're yeah. out in the middle of the woods and you're lost, it's nighttime, you'll be able to figure out where you're at and how to get where you're wanting to go. Some of the things that was interesting is that we had uh, weapon proficiencies that um, became class-specific or class-adjacent. Uh, mm-hmm. um, so let me find fighter because they decided to put that on a different... But um, as an example... Oh, sorry, warrior. They changed the nomenclature. Yeah. Um, so animal lore, armor, blind fighting. Blind uh, fighting was one that everybody wanted. I, yeah. I don't know of any character that i ever crossed that didn't have blind fighting uh set snares this was an odd one was running (laughs) Uh, (laughs) but if anybody's tried to do exercise not us um you know that running takes a bit of skill and some focus but um survival tracking and weapon smithing would be great non-weapon proficiencies you could add to a ranger or fighter type um and those things were available to you for the character to sort of flesh out um, there were some things that weren't needed like uh uh oh. we- weather knowledge in here when your character reached 40 <laughs> his knees hurt you know when it was going to rain so you didn't really that, need that, that stab wound from that goblin yeah, with the rusty yeah, dagger that, yeah. when you're level two you're like ah, i think it's uh. we're gonna get a storm this yeah. afternoon so <laughs> or when you have frostbite on your exposed bits, you're like, ah, it might be cold outside. I keep yeah. my bits covered. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, not all of the female fantasy armor did. The, uh, <laughs> the fighter was now a warrior. Yes. So the fighter was now a subclass of warrior, as was the ranger. And our bastard friend, the paladin, now got moved back under this. So it was a subclass of the warrior. Um, and that's in the Complete Fighters Handbook, which came out in 89. Yeah, that's um, the, I had that one up over here. Yeah, they... they... So many handbooks. <laughs> there we go. Uh, so. In addition to the new class options uh, called kits, uh, there are kits. Well, yeah, that's uh, where we, we see those in... The um... gave us Swashbuckler, uh, gave mm-hmm. us the Gladiator, uh, the Noble Warrior, and then introduced... Uh, mm-hmm. A lot of different skills and combat abilities. That, yeah, the, uh, that yeah. All those uh, kits, they, they went on to uh, uh, clerics and thieves and a number of others, but the kit is a um, a background. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It talks about your family or your heretical mm-hmm. background. So you were raised in a certain way. So, mm-hmm. of course, you're going to know how to do this, this, mm-hmm. and this. And regardless right. of anything else. And you're going to get advantages if you go this particular yeah. direction. So on the, on we, the we see that, that system yeah. used in a lot of different game systems. Like Star yeah. Wars, you have your type of character. You know, you're, you're a Jedi or you're a... Smuggler type. Smuggler or, type, yeah, whatever. So when you pick that, I want to be a smuggler, you have all these skills at a starting level mm-hmm. that you know how to do because you're a smuggler. Or and even in 5th edition person. with your backgrounds, you'll, you'll, be, you'll get access to artisans, mm-hmm. kits, or gym yeah. cutters, tools, and... Um, so we see a little of that as it's moved forward through the game, even. Yeah. Other warrior classes came up. The Amazon. Oh, right. Uh, yeah, baby. <laughs> uh, Barbarian was further fleshed out. You got the Berserker, which right. was one yeah. of my faves. Uh, the Cavalier was still around and, and got, a, got a revamp. And then Samurai, uh, which led to the Oriental Adventures mm-hmm. uh, expansion as well. Strength bonuses were furthered with the Bending Bars Lifting Gate so comparative uh, to. Uh, monsters. So a strength of 19 was equal to a hill giant strength. A mm. strength of 25 was equal to a titan strength. Right. So now you had comparisons rather than just, you know, uh, raw percent of ice and some raw numbers. They'd give you a little more to go with. Yeah, and 18 double uh, represented your peak human sort yeah. of, um, you know, strong man strength that you guys would see in competition carrying, you know, the Atlas stones and all that sort of stuff. But yeah, you the get guys these gauntlets or, or belts of this, the, you know, that yeah. and the other that would give you these higher strengths or you had something magical or you read something that would slowly start raising it. 
Uh, strength of 25, you had a raw plus 7 to hit, plus 14 damage. A weight limit of over 1,500 pounds. Oh, you, man. Can you imagine, if you had that kind of weight, you would be called by everybody's wife on Christmas. Uh, can just, you please... uh, just to hold the bag. I need you to hold our bags. Yes. <laughs> hey, can, you, can you come help me move this weekend? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you don't need so, your pickup. Just bring yourself. So. As we get into other things, um, some of the books that were available were these player options. Mm -hmm. uh, we also got some high-level option books um, as the game advanced and those campaigns got older and older. Um, so Combat and Tactics was a really interesting set. Uh, we got... Let me break it open here. Where we're really dealing with some of the wargaming aspects, mm -hmm. you know, grid squares, how to do different things, um, where to lay out your characters, how to protect your archers and wizards more effectively from the orcs and goblins that you're killing all the time. Um, so, you know, definitely any of the classes, were, it was a great time for Dungeons and Dragons, but Fighter really seemed to get a lot of the um, really nice fleshing out. Um, when I played these earlier editions, I played a lot of Fighter. We talked earlier about. Uh, being the dwarf with the warhammer because it was a lot of fun. We're doing the fighter magic user. Um, all of dual classing was still available in second edition, um, but with the options you had, it was it wasn't just fighter magic user. It was something that was off the wall, um, and we really started to see these unique character c concepts at the table. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, you'd figure out here's my concept. I've combined these classes and. Now I've expressed my character, and we go do the dungeon and save the universe. <laughs> <laughs> From going in the dungeon. It's, but... <laughs> it's just how it works. Yeah. Uh, the Castle Guide came out as a as the second edition uh, Dungeon Master supplement. The mm -hmm. Castle Guide uh, came out, uh, and that really gave a boon to building. I mean, it really fleshed even more out, and it opened up um, something that we hadn't been doing a lot of before, but AD&D opened up. Uh, downtime, things oh, yeah. to do after hours, things to do on your very first session, or things to to just take up an entire session doing something different that wasn't actually adventuring. You were building yourself or building your castle. You were building on something, right? Or if you couldn't get together, uh, you know, and you would call and talk, you know. Back, back <laughs> you know well, so and, right, certain well. <laughs> certain things that would either be done in a game session. Or that can be done outside of the game session. Yeah. Um, and a lot of that focused um, not on the combat aspects, uh, but some of the role play or the character maintenance type stuff. So I'm trying to gather this material to build a magical weapon. I'm trying to um, establish this fort, and I need to manage where do I find my gnome miners and my dwarf artisans and all this sorts of stuff that you needed to deal with. Um, and for the players and that wanted to... Excuse me. Uh, it's, okay. So for the players that wanted to actually get into yeah. <laughs> so. get into the um, the fine details of building that fortress, mm -hmm. managing it, that's not something you want at a regular play session, but could still be done as part of your downtime play. Yeah, you didn't see a monster manual at this time. You saw a monstrous compendium. This was actually yeah one of the interesting things for second edition. Loosely. Yeah, so it, you would buy it as a three ring binder with your basic monsters. Mm -hmm. And then as you added on to it, you got new inserts, and that you built your own monster companion uh, based on your needs for the, the uh, game. There, yeah. there were packs that would come with anywhere from 10 to uh, nearly 100 uh, monster character sheets, basically. Let's see, it had uh, volume one was 144 loose leaf yeah. pages with eight cardstock dividers that were just mm -hmm. gorgeous. Uh, volume two was 144 pages. Uh, volume three was 64 pages. But it had four more card stocks for separators yeah. uh, uh, for the monsters. So for each different world setting, like Greyhawk, Forgotten Realms, um, the Spelljammers, uh, I don't think it was Dark Sun, but each of the different world settings came, had their own pack. Of course, you had to go buy mm -hmm. separately. And even some uh, bigger adventures uh, that were box sets, like uh, some of the Planescape stuff, as well as... Um, there's just a number of them. They all came yeah. with the little packs yeah. that would have 10 to 25-ish monsters in it. So you put this in your three-ring binder, and your three-ring binder grew custom based on the game that you were playing. Yeah. It makes it difficult to go back if you're trying to find some of the second edition material and get the monsters manual because it didn't exist. I think there were some reprints and some certain things. 
but yeah, you had the monstrous manual. Monstrous uh, completing, yeah. I've got the I've got the big binder with all the all the things in it. I should have brought that. So just as a note, this was kind of some of the content that was out there. Uh, all these books that were available. Yeah, those were the and so this is you could put into it. <laughs> yeah, and it's yeah. so this one's like we got stuff from Ravenloft, Greyhawk. You got uh, Dark Sun in there too. Uh, there is some Dark Sun. There's Dragonlance. So whatever you were playing at the time, you could find those characters, those monsters, those NPCs, and add them to your collection so that you could kill all your players. I mean. So that your players can fight them. <laughs> um, I gotta have another long talk with these guys. <laughs> Second edition, I almost think that they hired on a whole new wing of marketing people because second edition blew up with stuff. Yeah, it, yeah. It there, stuff. Was, there was a lot of decent books for first edition, you, but they seemed uh, very purposeful. You know, Planescape alone has five box sets right and, and then another 42 pieces of items right and this, so this was the height of tsr and yeah. yeah they definitely expanded because everything that we see here is not just thrown out there it's not some guy that grabbed some articles from dragon magazine though there was still a lot of influence from these uh publications uh, and, and, and yeah. There, yeah but this is all professionally written added to the game with purpose um it's very good expanded material. Then Judges Guild, they came out, and yeah. that was some time back. Judges Guild came out, and they were putting out things that we were all looking for uh, in so many different ways. I mean, with the Book of yeah. Layers and, and uh, archaic names and so on, like mm -hmm. this on how to, how to build a name oh, the, uh, with the, dice rolls. And the list of books that came out as these softbacks that they listed as either supplements or accessories mm -hmm. is endless. Now and the modules just, that came oh, out. No, no, no. Oh, speaking oh, of, in, speaking of endless, uh, yeah, yeah, the modules starting in the A series and B and going on after <laughs> that plus the dual number, uh, <laughs> and some things that would be specifically for a gaming system. Some would be specifically for a particular world. Some of them would be something for the multiverse. Some of them were just out there or were side quests. Yeah, that this, would fit in. This was new. Side quests started coming up instead of having a module with everything. It was something that would come up that you could just throw in. And mm -hmm. that's where the Book of Layers came up. Oh, yeah. Uh, one and two. Uh, yep. And uh, there were several publications like the Book of Layers that, uh, that came out, the Book of Riddles uh, mm -hmm. and there's, there's Treasure several, Maps. There's several modules like that. that came out like that. One's called Child's Play. And it's, and it's <laughs> yeah. uh, basically a baby dragon gets you get, adopts you. <laughs> yeah. and... Somebody rolled a 12 on that table. <laughs> <laughs> well, Everybody goes into the dragon's lair to get the treasure, right? Mm -hmm. But what happens when you walk in and the egg is hatching? Yep. You get adopted by a baby dragon. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a, it's a very fun side quest. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not really a one-shot. A lot of these modules weren't really intended as a one-shot. Yeah. Like, we, like uh, players think of as today, you know, a four- to six-hour play. Some of them would have been two or three nights of right. that. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, I, I love all of them. I've got uh, two milk crates full of them. <laughs> so some of the things as we get back, specifically to some of the fighter stuff yes. in this book. Um, so Weapon the, specialization. Yeah, the player's option character point system replaces the normal acquisition of proficiency slots. So this book added a whole system that would replace another one. Um, we get into uh, weapon groups. Many weapons are very similar in construction and techniques of use. Uh, using a bastard sword with one hand is not too much different from using a long sword, though the swords were never designed that way. So you'll start to see exceptions and allowances as you get into building your character to become crazy good. Yeah, if you ever uh, go somewhere and look at a long sword and look at a bastard sword and pick the two up, you're going to go, <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. But some of the things that you start to see, um, so with melee weapons, at first to six with one level of specialization, you get three attacks every two rounds. Um, and so we don't see that anymore. Once you hit 6th level as a fighter in 5th edition, you can grab the two attacks per turn. Uh, some of the other martial classes will um, have that as features as well. Uh, but based on the specialization system, uh, you had to be either higher level or double specialized. It didn't start till 7th level to get 2 for 1. Yeah, and some of the ones here are crazy blowgun. So if you're a halfling, 5 attacks every 2 turns. Wow. And you were talking about the dart knight. Yeah. <laughs> Thrown dart. Four by one, five by one, six by one. Yeah. I mean, you're just like <laughs> chucking these things. And then, <laughs> so, um, depending on your character, Haste. concept. Oh, God. So. <laughs> Twelve by one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, you know, they're talking about effects of mastery. Uh, and then we get into different weapon styles. 
So, I mean, just a but, lot that you could do. A lot you could do with a lowly, simple fighter. Yeah. Right, and it's yeah. it's one of those things that's it's not necessarily uh, as flashy as being able to cast Fireball or nuke everything with Cone of Cold. Fireball! Sorry. Uh, a bit. <laughs> um, but, <Save. laughs> you know, when, it, when you are the fighter up front and, you know, something has to be beat to death, they can only call on you or the barbarian. It's a very short list. Mm -hmm. um, and particularly with the way that fighter has evolved, even through 5th edition, where you've got a defensive style for shields, two-weapon fighting, big weapons, um, or if you go ranged with archery, then that still gives you that flexibility, and you're still one of the most effective characters on the battlefield. Um, and as, a, as the options continue to evolve for you as a player, uh, we just set up some really cool characters. Yeah. It was a lot of fun. Uh, the specialization, it, yeah, it did break the game to the point of it made a, it made a DM's life kind of a two double hockey stick. <laughs> it did. Uh, well, when you're because... figuring out your CR yeah. for an encounter, <laughs> <laughs> don't forget to add a few points for the guy that can do three attacks around, four attacks around. Yeah. Well, or you could accidentally build a too powerful NPC. You're like, ah, oh, he's level three. Oh, wait, I can attack like 17 times. How do I do that? <laughs> you're like, well. Yeah. There was a know. lot of modifications that had to be done. And that's why we uh, actually in AD&D 2, we in our games relied on the modules because they were fairly balanced and made up for everything we had to calculate for in homebrew. Right. So we did more modules than we did homebrews in second edition. Yeah, a lot of the homebrew you saw in this era of D and D was uh, getting the players from module A to module B or a handwritten dungeon, whatever it was. But it was more of the connecting content. Filler campaigns. Yeah. Yeah. And we hold a class on that. <laughs> we do, and it's pretty nice. But um, it tended to be, you know, connecting the story. We didn't have very often um, large compendiums or books that would take us through a full campaign mm -hmm. uh, outside of certain box sets when those were released, like Planescape. The Slave Lords series uh, was awesome because you could take everything to deal with slaves and actually build uh, a, uh, a setup from zero level up to yeah and have your characters go and defeat and they, that yeah and then yeah. they came out with that book that had a lot of the slave lord stuff in it so that that was one of our faves because you could go from this point to this point instead of going okay what module you want to play next to us figuring out right which one we want to do because the weird thing is b1 and b2 and b3 weren't like right in a row it wasn't levels one to three b3 or b2 could be for levels 14 through 16 and mm -hmm. b3 was levels four mm -hmm. through six yeah it was, it was like, always kind of weird just you couldn't i count never on the... did understand it so i just bought the modules and <laughs> their catalog system was a little weird yeah but having played a lot in this era uh this you play a blended first and second um yeah. what do you think some of the strong points are for fighter when you get to those those different options, the options period. Are Just the, the options. There's the options go on and on and on. Mm -hmm. uh, forget if you want to specialize into some type specific fighter, like the ranger or the cavalier. Mm -hmm. Right. Just being a straight off the shelf fighter, and then you can add this skill, add this non weapon skill, add double specialize in your chosen weapon. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things we overlooked about weapon specializations is you can do two weapons at a time. Mm -hmm. So you take your lowly fighter, and you specialize in sword, and then you specialize in bow. Now you can attack both close and far. Right. And Still be highly, devastating. And highly, I, devastating, highly I, devastating. I remember doing that. We Like, everybody as in the adventuring party had a bow of some kind. Crossbow, oh. pistol crossbow, oh, yeah. short everybody. bow. you got to have your bows. So if you had a specialty fighter, who a, a ranger mm -hmm. or a cavalier, you have all those really cool skills that go with that class. And then on top of those skills, you can add some of these specializations. Uh, but just taking a straight fighter and you just wanted a guy that's because I, I don't want to deal with none of that mess. I don't want to deal with none of that mess. I just want to roll dice and kill monsters all night. Yeah. Get you Sword a fighter. <laughs> get yeah. you a fighter, Sword double specialize with a weapon, and, and get your dice ready. Yeah. Dwarf with a giant warhammer is my favorite. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Uh, so do you have any um, particular interesting characters concepts that you saw in this era? No, the uh, um, 
just taking a character like uh, like Troy said, just taking a character and running down a line, uh, taking that taking that tree, right? Uh, uh, the skill tree and turning it into a trunk, <laughs> right? You know, <laughs> with no dope. branches, uh, made devastating characters. The only the only thing was we would split the tree with a ranged weapon. And a melee weapon, and that was 100 percent of the time, and just take those yeah. up. So, yeah. uh, okay. when it came to forward. a fighter, when it came to a fighter, that uh, that was the easiest way. And uh, I highly recommend the supplement years because AD and D two <laughs> we stayed in for the longest time. Even when three came out, uh, we were in two five for ages. And I'll, I'll say too, one of the things that's great is uh, these are still applicable for fifth edition. Mm -hmm. There might be some uh, modifications required for certain content as you bring the second edition into line with 5th edition's mechanics. But if you're needing lore or different concepts, uh, you want to flesh out your elves or your dwarves, your half-orcs, whatever, um, these books are there, and they're still viable. They're great information. And um, a lot of what we're playing today is built on the core of these books and the world settings that we all played in at the time of their release. So, you know, if you can find them, pick them up, because they're only going to help your game. What he's saying is steal from everything. Steal. Well, yes. From everything. <laughs> everything is borrow borrow That's your ideas. Your story yeah. ideas can come from anywhere. Read. Uh, yeah. Even if you're playing a fifth edition uh, game, uh, you can go on eBay and find all of these accessory books for mm -hmm. anywhere from twenty to forty bucks. And I would suggest that starting with the fighters, and it does not really it does have stats in it. You know, plus mm -hmm. two to this, plus three to that. Big deal. Uh, you as the DM look at it and apply it to the game system you're running. Mm -hmm. If you're running fifth edition, you look at the the skill it's describing and the way it says to add this and 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 that. And if it makes sense to you, do it. If you don't like the way it describes it, change it. Mm -hmm. But give your players some more options when they're building their characters or they're using their characters. Can you imagine a fifth edition Eldritch Knight double specializing in anything? It'd be insane. Because <laughs> I, I love the that aspect. Of the character where you can throw the weapon and it returns. Yes. Well, now that I'm double specialized in chakra, <laughs> I'm like a cooler Xena, oh, which is somehow impossible. Yeah, again, Zena. again but... <laughs> pay attention to what Troy said. As a DM, look these up and see if you want yeah. to include them. Uh, don't pick them up as a player and then open it open up with your DM. Hey, listen, <laughs> I want to do this. It can be a trickier yeah. conversation. It, yeah. it can but, be, but you know, if you want as a DM, which is a little bit easier to introduce it, and if there's things about it that you like or things about yeah. it that you want to modify, that show great. these show these to your players as yeah. they're optional. Yeah, mm -hmm. and look through them, and everybody at the table should come to an agreement mm -hmm. on how you want to use any of the rules. And if you have a rule and you want to change it slightly to fit your gameplay, as long as everybody knows about mm -hmm. the rule. You're ready to go. Even um, if they never end up on the player side of the screen, if yeah. you're having, um, if you're trying to find different inspirations for world building, you know, when, when you have something that's fleshed out all of the elves, fleshed out all of the dwarves, whatever aspect that you're going to want to incorporate into your world, there's a ton of information there as well. And so now when your players go to this region and your world setting that you've crafted, uh, it really feels special. There's a full mm -hmm. flesh out of the region, the culture, mm -hmm the clothing, the foods, a lot of that can be found in these supplements yeah. as well. So take your 5e campaign and switch to Thacko. <laughs> no, no, don't switch to Thacko. <laughs> Punch him. Punch him. <laughs> I think that's it. I so, so. We'll get to yeah, the we'll second, second edition. Yeah. Um, we are going to now put all these books away, and when we come back, we're going to be doing third and fourth. Um, a little funky because we don't have a lot of those in print, but um, I've played a lot of third. Woody and actually plays in first edition Pathfinder, which was generated out there. So we'll tell you a little bit about how to break that game. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we got them on the on computer so, file, so we can yes. read yeah. them. Third edition is Mr. Producer's favorite. Yes, it is. Um, <laughs> but when we come back, third and fourth edition, The Fighter. I'm Jester Boris with I Want to Be a GM. I'm Troy, the Planescape guy. And I'm the fun one. <laughs> Gwydion, the long-winded. <laughs> we'll see you after the break.